have been talking about this series called First Things First, and uh, we're going to attempt to bring it to a close this week. So we've got, uh, if you've got your Bibles this morning, let's go to Proverbs chapter 3. Woo! Proverbs chapter 3. You got your sermon notes there and your worship guide. If you'd like to pull those out, you can follow along with us and fill in the blanks and take some notes. You can write extra notes on the back or whatever, another sheet of paper, write on your neighbor's paper, just whatever you want to do. Proverbs chapter 3, what I'm going to do first off is go through some of the things. If you weren't here last week, we're going to go through some of that and, and get you caught up. And uh, then we'll jump into the part that I'm going to talk about and spend some time on today. So in Proverbs chapter 3, in this part of the scripture, you know, we've been talking about three principles in first things first. We've been putting God first in every area of our life. We've been talking about all kinds of areas to do that, all kinds of ways to do that. And we talked about first things first where our finances are concerned. And there's three ways that we want to put God first from a financial standpoint. There's three principles we talked about. The principle of the tithe, principle of first fruit, and then today the principle of the firstborn. So that's where we are today. Let's look at Proverbs chapter 3, verse 9. It says, Honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first fruits of all your increase, so your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. So it says, honor the Lord with your possessions. When we read this and we talk about honoring the Lord, and sometimes from a spiritual standpoint, people say that money and spiritual things should not be mixed together. Well, there's a reason that God should be involved in every area of our life because every area that he touches gets better. So if, I'm, if God's good for me in this area of my life, he's going to be good for me in every area of my life. So when it says honor the Lord with your possessions, the word honor is very important there. The word honor, as you see there in your notes, means reverence or respect for a person of superior standing. The biggest thing about honor is we got to understand this. Do we have somebody in our life who is superior to us? Honor means that you are ahead of me. Your ways are ahead of my ways. For God to be the Lord of my life means he's superior to me. In other words, I obey him or I go with his leading. I go with his instructions. So honor is someone in a superior standing. If someone's not a superior to you, it's going to be difficult for you to honor them. Uh, we should honor everyone. I understand what you're saying in that context, but it, this is what it means here. So honoring with your possessions with your, with your cattle and all this they were talking about, the first fruits of all your increase, so your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. Here's what we don't do. <clears throat> Notice what it says, honor the Lord with your possessions, put him first, and then your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. Your barns being filled with plenty and your vats overflowing with new wine is the promise of God that's attached to what he's asking us to do. He says, honor me with your possessions, and then here's the promise. The promise is your barns will be filled with plenty, your vats will overflow. Here's where we make the mistake. We get attached to the promise instead of the promise giver. We start looking for the promise. In other words, I'll give so that my barns will be filled. Now I'm looking for the promise instead of looking to the promise giver. My, my part is just to honor God. My, my part is not to look at my barns and say, why aren't you filling them? My part's not to say, my vats ain't overflowing. Amen. They're not even to the rim, let alone overflow. They're not even half. I'm just to keep honoring God. His promise is his job. So we, here's where we get, a little, we get a little off kilter when we start focusing on what God's promised and we're wanting that. I want that. I want that instead of I want him. You want him. He's better than that. Whatever that is down here, he's always better. So make sure our relationship with God is built on that. Then the, the next two ways to illustrate it, we talked about 2 Kings chapter 4, verse 42. We talked about there that God is always more than enough. Read that story and find out what we was talking about there. God is always more than enough. And the second one, we talked about the widow and how she just had enough food for her and her child and she was going to eat it and die. And the prophet said, uh, in verse 13, do not fear, go and do as you have said, but make me a small cake from it first. Make it first. She just had enough for her and her child. They're going to eat it and die. And he said, give it to me first, and then you go eat. So then we filled out this statement here. We will have to deal with fear in order to give God first. 
How many knows that's right? It's, you're going to have to deal with fear when you're giving God first. And we illustrated that in that story. You can check it out. Listen to last week. So let's go to where we are this week. Point number two, turn your Bibles to Exodus chapter 13. And let's look at what we're talking about here. This is going to be the principle of the firstborn. Principle of firstborn. Exodus chapter 13. Read along with me there in your Bibles in verse 1. It says, Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Consecrate to me all the firstborn, whatever opens the womb among the children of Israel, both of man and beast, it is mine. Now here's the principle of the firstborn. The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Number one, consecrate to me. Now consecrate sounds like a very spiritual, biblical word, so let's see what the word consecrate means. It means to set apart unto something really, like set apart unto God, unto him, holy in a different sphere or category, category, sacred or dedicated. So now he says, consecrate to me the firstborn. Everything that's first, it's separate, it's holy, it's in a different category. It's sacred or dedicated. Now the word sacred or dedicated means devoted to one thing, or given to a particular cause or purpose. I'm going to lay some groundwork for you here starting off because it's very important. When he says, consecrate to me all the firstborn, they're they're in a different category. They're sacred. They're dedicated. They're dedicated for a purpose. Here's what you and I need to understand. The words uh, consecrated here means it has a purpose. It has a designated set function. So the firstborn in God's eyes is even in a different category. It's not all your 100%. He's like the first. The firstborn is in a whole separate category, not to be confused with the rest. It's different. And that different part has a specific purpose. So get this. This part's what's important. We will give to God first if we understand that first has a purpose and we understand what that purpose is. If I think it's just part of my whole and I'm just giving out, that's not going to work. It's not going to bring the understanding that we need. But when I understand when he says, hey, consecrate to me the first, it's in a different category. It's got a specific purpose, different from the rest. So make sure it fulfills its purpose. Now, what is its purpose? That's key because we got to know what he's talking about. Let's jump down to verse 11. So we know it's got a different purpose. It's sacred. It's dedicated. Don't be confused and read the rest of it. Verse 11 says, And it shall be when the Lord brings you into the land of Canaanites, as he swore to you and your fathers and gives it to you, that you shall set, you shall set apart to the Lord all that open the womb, that is, every firstborn that comes from an, an animal which you have, the male shall be the Lord's. Who does the firstborn belong to? It belongs to the Lord. Verse 2 said the same thing, that it was mine. So let's look at verse 13. But every firstborn of a donkey you shall redeem with a lamb, And if you will not redeem it, then you shall break its neck. And all the firstborn of every man among the sons you shall redeem. So it shall be when your son asks you in time to come, saying, What is this that you shall say to him by strength of hand? The Lord brought us out of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. And it came to pass when Pharaoh was stubborn about letting us go, that the Lord killed all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both the firstborn of man and the firstborn of the beast. Therefore, because of that, I sacrifice to the Lord all males that open the womb, but all the firstborn of my sons I redeem. It shall be as a sign on your hand hand, and as frontlets between your eyes, for by strength of hand the Lord brought us out of Egypt. So now let's break this down. Go back to verse 13. He said to consecrate, consecrate to me, the first. What does this mean? Verse 13 says, but every firstborn of the donkey you shall redeem with the lamb. And if you will not redeem it, then you shall break its neck. Here was the purpose of the first. The firstborn had this, it was separate from the rest. So jot this down in your notes. The first is separate from the rest. It's sacred or dedicated. You got that. Then verse 13, the firstborn either had to be one of two things, sacrificed or redeemed. And I know this may sound like, what does this have to do with me? It has a lot to do with you, so stay with me. The firstborn, one of two things, had to be either sacrificed or redeemed. Two functions of the firstborn. Now, what does that mean? What does the word redeem mean? The word redeem means to be ransomed or rescued or delivered. Ransomed, rescued, or delivered. If it was a clean animal, a lamb, it was sacrificed. If it was an unclean animal, a donkey, then what happened to it? It got redeemed. 
Clean, sacrificed, unclean, got redeemed. So now, notice what happens. He, he redeemed us. The word redeem means to ransom, rescue, or deliver. Ransom, rescue. So the purpose of the firstborn is this. It has a, a function. Remember, it's a purpose. Its purpose is to redeem the rest. Its purpose is to rescue or deliver the rest. That's the function of the firstborn. Now, Jesus said in the, uh, the word ransom, let's put it this way. The word ransom means to payment, a payment to release someone from captivity. So if I've been ransomed, I've been released from captivity. That's what a ransom means. It's a payment that's made so that someone can go free. So whenever the, the firstborn redeems the rest or ransoms the rest, it sets free everything after that, everything that's connected to that. Another definition for redeem is this, the transfer of ownership from one person to another through the payment of a price or an equivalent substitute. So no, now again, I'm just laying the groundwork. We need to understand why the Bible's saying this firstborn had to be sacrificed or redeemed, and what does it mean to be redeemed? Which am I? Am I clean? Am I unclean? What does all that mean? What is that, what is that relevant to me in 2014? Here's what we're talking about. True redemption, then, does not just mean that I'm rescued or delivered. It also means a transfer of ownership from one person to another. When I'm truly redeemed, that means this person owned me. I was under its lordship or rulership, but a price was paid. Now I go under a different owner, and I'm subject to different rules. I'm not held captive by that person. Now I've been set free and I'm owned by this person that bought me. You follow what I'm saying? All right. So now every firstborn, every firstborn either had to be sacrificed or redeemed. Every firstborn had to be sacrificed or redeemed. So now let's see how that re is relevant to us. Colossians chapter 1 verse 15. Jesus was God's firstborn. What did the firstborn have to do? It had to either be sacrificed or redeemed. Colossians chapter 1, verse 15. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. Jesus was God's firstborn. Jesus was God's firstborn. So not, we're not trying to go deep. We're trying to bring something home that's very relevant to us as far as how we live our life. Jesus was God's firstborn. So if he was God's firstborn, what was the rule for the firstborn? It either had to be sacrificed or redeemed. If it was clean, it was sacrificed. If it was uncleaned, it was redeemed. All right? So now Jesus, or God in Matthew chapter 3, verse 17, and suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, this is my beloved son in who I'm well pleased. So Jesus, God's son, is firstborn. What was Jesus called? John chapter 1, verse 29. The next day, John saw Jesus coming from afar toward him, and he says, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So Jesus was called in John chapter 1, verse 29, the Lamb of God. So now, the lamb, what was the rule for the lamb? If a lamb was born, was it clean or unclean? It was clean. What was supposed to happen to the clean? Was it supposed to be sacrificed or redeemed? Sacrificed. Jesus was the lamb of God. He was the firstborn of God. So because Jesus was the lamb of God and the firstborn of God, he had to be sacrificed. Sacrificed. So Jesus was God's firstborn. He was pure, clean, spotless lamb. What about you and I? Were we born clean or unclean? Why are you just hating on yourself? You just assumed you were unclean. You're right. Ephesians chapter 2. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 2 says this. We were by nature children of wrath just as the others. We were not sinners. If you're born again today, you were not a sinner because you sinned. You were a sinner because what you were born into. My precious little babies, all five of them, were born into the world sinners. They were born under the nature of sin because Adam sinned, and he was the original father on the earth. So everything that was born of Adam was received his sin nature. So I was a sinner not because I did bad deeds. I was a sinner because what I was born under. 
This is very important for us to get. If I will get this, then everybody on the planet will know they need a savior whether they're a good person or not. See, too many times, I did, did a funeral again this week, and every time I do a funeral, people talk and they'll say, well, I just pray that my good deeds outweigh my bad deeds. I say, it has nothing to do with whether you'll spend eternity in heaven or eternity in hell. It has nothing to do with your good deeds outweighing your bad deeds. It's about one man, his name is Jesus. There was no good deeds I could do to get me into heaven. Nothing I could do, because I was born unclean. Because I was born unclean, I can't get to heaven. So you say, well, 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 then how do I get there? I'm glad you asked. <laughs> Somebody had to be sacrificed so I could be redeemed. Who could be sacrificed so I could be redeemed? It had to be a lamb and a lamb without spot, without blemish. Who could that be? Your notes there says we were all born unclean sinners with an active sin nature. We were born unclean. Jesus was sacrificed to redeem us. Jesus was sacrificed to redeem us, to buy us back. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18 says this, Knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. We were not bought with money. Money can't buy me heaven. As the prophetic song by the Beatles used to say, you can't buy me love. <laughs> you can't. I'm not sure it's prophetic. I'm just saying. <laughs> it didn't go over too well. See, all I'm saying is you can't buy heaven. Silver and gold. In other words, good deeds won't get me in. Nothing I can do gets me in. It's by the precious blood of Jesus that we make it into heaven. It's by what Jesus did because he was pure, without spot, without blemish. He never sinned because he never sinned. Now, now Jesus came and Jesus was called the second Adam. The first Adam sinned because he sinned. Everything that he fathered, Cain, Abel, Seth, all the way down the line. Everyone he fathered, including you and I, were born under his nature. But Jesus was not conceived by Joseph. He was conceived by the Holy Spirit. And because he was conceived by the Holy Spirit, Spirit, he's from a different lineage than the first Adam. <laughs> this is good for you and I. Because he came from God, from a divine lineage. Now everyone that's born of him that comes under his lineage is clean. Everyone that comes under his gets redeemed. By the blood of the Lamb. Uh, Galatians chapter 4 says this. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those. Look at your neighbor and tell him I've been redeemed. <laughs> to redeem those who were under the law that we might receive the adoption as sons and daughters. That's not gender specific. And because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying out, Abba, father or daddy. Therefore, you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Jesus Christ. See, here's what happened. Remember Egypt? The Israelites were slaves to Egypt, right? But they got Ransom, they got bought by the blood of the Lamb and they were brought out of captivity. They were no longer slaves under Egypt. They became free with God. Same way, I was born into a sin nature. I was born under the law of sin. But Jesus came, paid the price for me with his precious blood. And because of that, if I will receive him, then now I get redeemed out of sin and bondage and I get set free to live for Jesus Christ. This is the power of the firstborn. The purpose of the firstborn is to redeem the rest. The firstborn's sole purpose is to bring redemption and freedom to everyone that's born after it. So now, we see this. Giving the firstborn takes an act of faith. And point three, giving the firstborn first takes an act of faith. So now, God gave Jesus before we believed. Before we believed. Let me tell you this. 
Romans chapter 5, verse 8. But God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. When did Jesus die for us? Before or after you believed? Before. He died before. God gave Jesus in faith, believing. He says he gave, gave Jesus in faith, Romans 8, 29, for whom he foreknew he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Notice what it says here. Jesus was the firstborn. What was the firstborn supposed to be doing? It's supposed to be sacrificed or redeemed. If it was clean, it's supposed to be sacrificed. If it's unclean, it's supposed to be redeemed. Jesus was born clean, so he had to be sacrificed. You and I were born unclean. We had to be redeemed. I was redeemed because Jesus died for me. So now every person in the sound of my voice, everyone listening to me needs to know one thing. Without Jesus, we're not clean. Without Jesus, I'm not alive. The purpose of the firstborn the sole purpose of the firstborn is to redeem everything that comes after that. So now Jesus, being the firstborn, went and died on a cross. Sin was, was weighing over all of mankind because of Adam's sin. We're all under the same penalty. We all had to die. This is why you and I didn't die on a cross, because unclean was not sacrificed. Unclean was redeemed. This is why I couldn't die on the cross, even for my own sins. Who's with me? <laughs> I couldn't even go to the cross for my own sins. It would have been an unclean person trying to pay for an unclean person. It wouldn't work. This is the power of what Jesus did for us. He was clean. He did nothing wrong. He never hurt anybody. He never even sinned. And that made him the perfect candidate to pay for your sins, to pay for mine. That's why he was sacrificed as a lamb. That's why he hung on the cross because he said, now, if I will be sacrificed as the firstborn, anyone who puts their faith in me and is born of me. This is why the Bible says that we're not only supposed to be born of water or of flesh and blood, but we're also supposed to be born of the spirit. This is why when, when Nicodemus came to Jesus at night and he said, Jesus, what must I do to enter the kingdom of heaven? Jesus said, you must be born again. He did not say, well, Nicodemus, you need to stop doing this. You need to stop doing that. You need to stop doing this and stop doing that. If you'll just quit drinking, smoking, cuss, and sleeping around, you'll be in, Nicodemus. He didn't say that. But yet most people on the earth try and take that path to get to God. If I'll just be a good little boy, God will love me. God loves you in your worst moment. He loves you in your rottenness, stinkiness, sinful, most worst, pathetic, perverted, disgusting self. He does not love you more when you get things straightened out. But people constantly trying to earn the approval of God. He sent his son to die on a cross because we would never earn his approval. But he loved God so loved that he gave. He loved, so he gave. So now all he's saying to you and I is if we will accept the firstborn offering, then now we too can be redeemed and walk in everlasting life. It's not about what you and I do. It's about what Jesus did. Take the pressure off yourself and just walk in the love of God and receive the promise that God's given you. Now, now people, some will get uptight and start saying, now wait a minute, you're saying I can do whatever I want when I want, it doesn't matter. No, no, that's not what love is. Love honors and love wants to do whatever that person that died for them has, has instructed them to do. Love, you want to honor them. You want to serve them. And so when I understand now that Jesus died for me out of love, I don't say, do I have to? I understand, do I get to? Do I get to? Because, and this is when giving God your first, whether it's finances or any other part of your life, if I understand that the purpose of that first is to redeem the rest, then I want to put God first. If I understand that 90% of redeemed money is better than 100% of unredeemed money, I want to give God the first. Amen's dropped off right there, but that's all right. That's all right. This is what the principle is of firstborn. It's saying, God, of my time. If I understand I'm going to give God the first part of my time, of my day, then the rest of my day will be redeemed. 
The purpose of putting God first is not just so he can put a smiley face sticker on your board in heaven. It is because it has redemption power for everything that comes after it. Why do you want to get up and give God the first part of your day? Because you need your time redeemed. How many people is running out of time in the day? Oh, I just need more hours in the day. Here's what we do. Make, we make the mistake is we want to give God out of our excess, our extra, our leftover, instead of giving him first. If we give him first, we will have extra. But when we eat his, his time, God, I don't have time. I don't have time. I've got to get up and kind of watch the news and check Facebook and Snapchat, Twitter, go through all of that. I got to check through all that and I got to get, get myself wound up and then I'll finally get into my day. And then at the end of the day, then maybe I get some time I'll give to God and you're <laughs> wanting to crash out, wonder why. Understand what the principle of first things first means. Why we're talking about this series. If you put God first in a category, he redeems everything after that. Adam sinned, right? Everything under him was not redeemed. It was unclean. Jesus did not sin, died, sacrificed as a lamb. Everyone born of him is born again. Everyone born of him is redeemed. Redeemed. And this is a power. Finances. I put God first in my finances. <laughs> finances are redeemed. Put God first in my time. Mm, my time is redeemed. Put God first in my thoughts. My thoughts are redeemed. See, we've got to understand this power of this, that the firstborn purpose, wait a minute, I've got a day here, and the first part of my day has a purpose. It's, it's dedicated. Remember, he said it's holy. It's in a separate category. Don't lump all your 24 hours in one lump sum. Take the first part, put it, that's a different category. That belongs to God. That's God's. Mm, that, that doesn't, nope, that's his. I've got the rest. Whatever the rest is, whether that rest is 23 hours or 23 and a half, 23, 15, whatever it is, give him the first and watch what he does with the rest of your day. When you have a problem, when you have a situation, a decision to make, go to God first and see what happens with the rest of your thoughts. Financially, putting God first, see what happens with the rest. Here's what God wants to do in your life. He wants to redeem everything. He's the redeemer. What does the redeemer do? The redeemer pays money to transfer ownership, and he wants to be the one that's lord over your life instead of the other. He wants to get us out of bondage, get us out of, out of junk, out of being led by emotions and feelings and tragedy and all this stuff, and he wants us to be led by him because he said in his word he's going to lead us, and lead us in paths of righteousness for his namesake. Would I rather be a slave or would I rather be free under God? I want to be free. So now I've got to understand, as I'm sitting here today, I've got to realize that I need to be redeemed. And I'm not going to be redeemed by myself. I'm going to be redeemed by the blood of Jesus. I need my time redeemed. I need my finance redeemed. I need my relationships redeemed. I need, I need my job redeemed. So what do I need to do? I need to put him first. Put him first place. So let's finish these notes here. The last part, God gave his best and he gave it first. He gave his best and he gave it first. It always requires faith to give the first. Hey, remember this? Remember this part of the story in Exodus? Okay, you're the dad? Put yourself in this scenario. Let's climb inside this story and waller around a little bit. So you're the dad right there and you're getting ready to give birth to that new little baby lamb. And you got, your, you got your little son right here. This is what it's talking about in, in verse 14, I believe it is. And, and a little baby lamb comes in, such a cute little lammy. You look at the lammy, pretty lammy. Bring little lammy over here, set it on the table. Son comes over, it's firstborn, first, first lamb's ever seen. Don't you love the lamb? It's a pretty little lamb. Father, thank you for this firstborn. Hi, Jacob! <laughs> Jump in. <laughs> I'm not sure it would go like that, but. You sacrifice the lamb, however you do it. Maybe you're not as demonstrative when I sacrifice, but I really like to get into my sacrifices. So you, you sacrifice your lamb, however you do it. And your son goes... <laughs> right? That's what I would be doing. I'm just climbing in the story. So he's like, 
Daddy, why did you kill Lammy? Why did you kill Lammy? It tells you what to say when your son gets jacked up. He says right here. It, says, it does. He, he was prepared for that response. So verse 14, so it shall be when your son asks you in the time coming, what is this? <laughs> in, other, in other words, what in the world are you doing? Right? What are you supposed to say? You tell him, you say, son, by strength of hand, the Lord brought us out of Egypt and out of the house of bondage. Pharaoh didn't want to let us go. So the strength of God's hand Verse 16, by strength of hand, the Lord brought us out of Egypt. So when, he's, when you're offering that lamb, you turn to your son. You say, son, that first belongs to God because God delivered us out of Egypt. And I sacrifice to God in gratitude and worship, thanking him that I am no longer in bondage, but I've been set free by the blood of the lamb. So now, when you're, going around, you're at your house and you're giving, maybe you're giving your first fruits to the church, you're, you're signing your, your tithe check and you're giving, and the son comes along or daughter comes along and they say, Daddy, why are you giving money to the church? Why are you giving so much? You say, son, let me tell you why. Let me tell you why. The blood of the Lamb redeemed me from the curse of sin and death and God brought me out with a strong hand and I'm no longer under bondage, but I've been set free. That's why I give my tithe. That's why I honor God with the first fruits and that son can understand and be taught the principles of putting God first. When you put God first, it honors and redeems the rest. And this is what he's talking about in that verse. He's saying, listen, you've got to train your kids. You've got to train people to put God first because they're not going to do it on their own. You get, that, you get that donkey out, that first colt, you got to understand that was money. When an animal was born, that was as good as money. And that, that colt comes out, and since it's an unclean animal, it has to be redeemed, right? So you either have to take a clean animal and sacrifice it in the place of that colt, or if you say, I don't have an animal that I can sacrifice in the place of that, they said, you have to break its neck. In other words, you have to sacrifice it to God first. What does that mean? And there's a lot to say here. Sometimes we got to sacrifice to God first, and it's, it's saying no to me and yes to God. In other words, I'm not my provider. God, you are my provider. I'm not the one who guides my day. You're the one who guides my day. Why do I put you first? Early in the morning, I will seek you, David said. Why do I put you first? Because God, you will guide me better than my own thoughts. You will guide me better. Why do I put you first in any area of my life? He's saying, the first has redemption power. It's its purpose, it's sacred, it's dedicated. And if we will get that, then we will wanna put the first in its job. We will wanna get it doing what it's supposed to be doing. I'm like, wait a minute, the first, get out of here. You're separate, you go do what you're supposed to do. Go redeem. I don't want you in here mixing up the rest of it. You're gonna contaminate the rest of it. You've got a separate function. That's the power of the firstborn. That's the power of putting God first in any area of our life. We gotta realize that God first, is another category. Put him there and honor him with that. Would you bow your heads with me this morning? Here's what I want to ask you today. Is God first place? What areas of your life need to be redeemed? If you just go ahead and leave the house lights up a little bit, I want to be able to see people. As we're praying, as your heads are bowed this morning, I want to ask you a very important question. Are you like the individual that spoke to me and said, I sure hope my good deeds outweigh my bad deeds? Are you sitting here today hoping your approval in heaven is based on how good you are? Let me tell you, friends, none of us will win in that scenario. None of us will ever be good enough. The power of the firstborn, the principle of the firstborn is saying a clean has to die to redeem the rest. Jesus had to be clean and he had to die to redeem us who were born unclean. So only through him, only through him can we experience true freedom. And maybe you're here today and you're saying, Chad, I've never accepted that redemption through Jesus. I've not made him my owner. I've not given him ownership of my heart. 
If you're in that situation, maybe you've ran from God, maybe you're not in a place where you have any relationship with God whatsoever, I want to give you an opportunity to make a fresh start and get that changed around today. Maybe you're a believer and you're saying, I, I'm fine, I'm going to heaven, so I guess I can check out of this part of the service. No. Here's what God's asking of you. Am I first in every area? Are you coming to me first in every category? I know I'm supposed to, but I know I'm supposed to doesn't do it. Do you do it? Too many times Christians know what they're supposed to do, and sometimes they don't do it any more than people that don't even know they're supposed to do it. That's the sad part of it. I know I'm supposed to, but they don't do it any more than those who don't know anything about it. So is God speaking to your heart saying, hey, it's time to give me the first part of your day. Hey, it's time to put me first financially. It's time to put me first in your mind, in your emotions. It's time to put me first in your thought life. It's time to put me first in your job. It's time to put me first in your schoolwork. First things first, the principle of the firstborn. God says it's a separate part. I want to redeem you. I want to redeem every area of your life. And every area that I'm not first, it is not covered in redemption. So if you're here today and you're saying, Chad, I need, to, I need to make Jesus the Lord of my life. I, I realize now that I was born unclean and my good deeds will never get me into heaven. That it's only because of the pure blood of Jesus, a lamb without spot or without blemish. It's only because of him that I can be redeemed. I must be born again. Not, I'll try and do better. That's not born again. Born again is a new person. New creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things become new. Doesn't mean everything changes overnight, but your nature changes. You're not given to sin anymore. It's not a desire. It's not something you do readily. It's not something you're moved to do. It's something that may happen, but not, out of a, not part of your nature. So several areas I know God is dealing with. Prayer team, ministry team, if you would come to the front, I want you to be prepared. But just continue with your heads bowed and eyes closed. Here's what I want to ask you. If you're here today and you're saying, Chad, I need, I need redemption. I want to make Jesus the Lord of my life. I want to turn things today. I want to receive the blood of Jesus as payment for my sin. And I will put him in first place in my life. How can you respond? How can you, how can you do that? You may ask him. I want you to do it by raising your hand and saying, yes, Lord, I want, you, I want to invite you. I want to pray with you. So right where you are, just shoot your hand up in the air and you're saying, Chad, that's me. And I want to make Jesus the Lord of my life. I want to receive what he's got. Here's one, two, three. Who else? God's dealing with you. You need to be redeemed. Here's four. Who else? There's five. Who else? I see a hand in the back. There's six. Who else? Come on, that's awesome. We got six people that saying the blood of the lamb is what I want. I want to choose that right here for my life. Six people, anyone else? wants to join them. Knew God was dealing with hearts today. Come on, be praying. You're a, you're a believer. Pray. This is the most important moment in their life is to choose the redemption blood of Jesus, to turn their life around. Realize that their goodness will never be enough. Anyone else, I want to give you an opportunity if you want to pray with us. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. All right, I want us to pray, and I want you everyone, everyone to bow and pray with us. So six that raised your hand, you know who you are. I want you to pray with me, and I want, I want to give you some words to pray. And I'm, you give the meaning to it. I'm just going to guide you, but you're not praying to me. You're praying to Jesus, the one who died for you, and you're asking him to come into your life. You're asking him to be the one who becomes your Lord. So say this, Father in heaven, thank you for giving Jesus to redeem me. I believe he was clean and died for me who was unclean. I need a savior and Jesus, you are him. So come into my life and be my savior. I welcome you into my heart. Take over my life and be my Lord. Thank you for setting me free from sin and redeeming me into new life. 
In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Come on, let's give him a hand this morning. Amen. Thank you, Lord.